live in the uh, Stockholm reactor. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will talk about uh, AI and debating, how we can use AI uh, to argue with humans. Uh, so, spoiler alert. I like to always start with a spoiler alert for these sessions where I have a question, so you don't have to sit in suspense uh, all day before uh, you know we answer the question that the workshop answers, and that is, it can. It, AI can debate humans. Uh, so we will do a kind of a deep dive into a, um, a project called Project Debater uh, that was made by IBM. So they first had a public debate uh, with a gentleman named Harish, who's from Cambridge, I believe, or originally uh, was a Cambridge debater. Uh, they had a public debate on we should subsidize preschool. So we'll show um, some clips of that uh, throughout this workshop so you can get an understanding of what we're actually talking about. Um, and give you a feel of AI actually debating a human. So I think I didn't test this, but of course, I hope you can probably hear this on the stream because I'm doing it from the audio. Can you hear it in there? Yeah. For decades, research has demonstrated that high-quality preschool is one of the best investments of public dollars, resulting in children who fare better on tests and have more successful lives than those without the same access. Secondly, a few words about poverty. While I cannot experience poverty directly and have no complaints concerning my own standards of living, mm -hmm. I still have the following to share. Regarding poverty, research clearly shows that a good preschool can help kids overcome the disadvantages often associated with poverty. The OECD has recommended that government subsidize pre-primary education to boost performance in poor areas. A statistical summary of studies from 1960 and 2013 by the National Institute for Early Education Research found that high-quality preschool can create long-term academic and social benefits for individuals and society, far exceeding costs. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that universal full-day preschool creates significant economic savings in health care, as well as decreased crime, welfare dependence, and child abuse. Former Prime Minister Gough Whitlam said in 1973 that preschool is the greatest single aid in removing or modifying the inequalities of background, environment, family income, or family nationality. Now to an additional, final issue. A study by the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research shows that attendance. Cool. So that. Is, uh, uh, let me turn it over. So that is a uh, pre brief uh, preview of what actually happened in that debate. Uh, and if you're interested in and worried about, uh, you know, who won the debate, uh, Team Human did win. Uh, so there was a voting pool, which we'll talk about later about the results. And at least humans can still beat an AI in debating, uh, at least for the time period of now. Uh, we'll see. Uh, obviously, AI is always advancing. Uh, and maybe, I don't know, humans are advancing in debate too. Uh, but the, the, the contest is still ongoing. Uh, but a little introduction to myself. So I'm a cloud advocate here at Microsoft, uh, specifically here in the reactor. I, my main passion and main focus is AI. I organize a uh, meetup, another meetup here called the Stockholm Machine Learning Club. So we are all about doing and making stuff with AI. And I'm also a former debater. So that's what really brings my interest into this space. I have never lost to an AI. I've never competed against an AI. But I'm sure uh, with my debate record, uh, I, I can probably at least do some, do some damage on if I do a one-on-one -on -one with an AI. So I, I'm confident in my skills there. Uh, and you can follow me on, on Twitter if you like, at Corey Space. I'm always sharing things around AI and really uh, examples of people building some interesting stuff. So today's talk, we're going to divide this into sort of two main areas. Uh, first is how Project Debater works. So I'm going to talk about more about the technical approach, uh, how uh, the different models behind there are actually working and the data sets that they built around that. Uh, and then uh, my colleague, Steve, who you won't see until later, uh, has three concerns for AI debate. He is a professor of debate, so he is, has his concerns maybe about how the, the world of the technology has approached debate uh, and whether it's even a, a worthy pursuit to uh, have an AI debate. Um, so those, those are kind of be our two levels of today's talk. And why is it interesting? Why have you joined us here on a Wednesday 
or maybe you're watching this on demand later on, but why are we all gathered here to talk about AI and uh, debating? And I think there's kind of three reasons, for me at least. Um, you know, we talk about AI and when we always have like a comp competition versus humans, it's always something maybe rule-based. Uh, can the AI beat me in, beat humans in chess? Or can the AI beat uh, humans in Go or AI in, in, in StarCraft? Where there's like distinct rules and distinct strategies of maybe to get an advantage. Where a debate is more subjective. Um, you know, people will say, uh, you know, it just depends on uh, who's debating or it depends on the argument or it depends on who you're trying to persuade the debate. So it's all of these kind of uh, gray areas that debate brings. And how do we have an AI kind of learn from, from those sorts of subjective arguments uh, and still determine and produce something in a debate? Also, I think this is like beyond AI as an assistant. So, uh, you know, AI, we all have like probably assistants in our pockets. Uh, and we've seen NLP in, in applied to different chatbots where we ask AI something, it gives it back to us, uh, and you can process the language. But now it's understanding how AI can, um, you know, change that, but also argue with us. And then also, you know, is this a road to AGI, you know, artificial general intelligence? Some people say debate is like, the path to self-actualization uh, and you needing to argue. And if, if a debate, an AI can debate self and become self-actualized, then this is something maybe we are getting to the artificial general intelligence that we have. So I'm going to talk about how it works. This is a general uh, brief overview of the architecture. Unfortunately, like, you know, we don't have like debate Tron 1000 where we just have one giant robot that's uh, debating for us. It's actually going to be, it's broken down into different modules. Uh, so I think I've, on the next slide, uh, broken this down into uh, four different modules, which is argument mining, argument knowledge base, pulling from the arguments, uh, rebuttal, and then debate construction. And Steve's probably going to talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, kind of the general approaches to debate and maybe how this is aligned or not aligned. But you can see uh, how they sort of approach this project. Uh, first, we need to find some arguments. We can build some sort of database there. And obviously, the, uh, the AI is debating someone, so you need to rebuttal or you need to refute or say why the other person is wrong. Uh, so the, the, there needs to be a module there. And then actually constructing a speech is super important because that's where it's you know, delivering and persuading the audience. So on the argument mining side, so they have this kind of divided into two stages uh, when they're sort of building this module. Uh, first one is the offline stage. Uh, so this is, they actually took uh, LexisNexis corpus. And LexisNexis is like a, a huge database of kind of legal thing, legal documents, as newspaper documents. So they took around 400 million articles. So just to give you a general scale of uh, what they were working with from 2011 to 2018. I'm not sh this was kind of more, I don't know, more recent. This project kind of launched around the 2019. Um, level. So that's probably why they just took the most recent articles there. And essentially what they did was first they take the articles and they kind of divide them into sentences. Uh, and then in the sentences, they use the model to sort of pull out conceptual words within there. And then they use those concepts to do what is called like wikification, uh, which is something I <laughs> really liked. Uh, but it's also called entity linking. So to understand the actual context. And you can kind of understand it if you've ever been through like the rabbit hole yourself of Wikipedia where you, you learn something and then you like have all these deep links and you keep going and now you have like 30 tabs open uh, trying to find the real meaning of what you first started with. Essentially, that's what they did for mining these arguments. So they, just to give you an example here, you know, Paris is the capital of France is a statement, uh, but to understand that actual context of the entity linking there, they need to first look at Paris uh, and oh, okay, Paris is a country. Uh, here's all the details about uh, Paris. And then also uh, France being the capital uh, and knowing, understanding the, the kind of facts around France as well. Because, you know, there's other smaller towns around the world. There's Paris, Texas, for example. And if you didn't have that context, if you didn't understand that, uh, the model uh, didn't kind of go through this entity linking, it wouldn't actually understand the context uh, when you're going through these articles and dividing uh, and finding the concepts of the sentences. After that, they took it to the online stage. And essentially what that starts with is receiving the motion. And the motion is basically the topic that uh, is going to be up for debate. They, in they did an index search. So they sent all of those sentences, the 400 million uh, articles that they had, and they indexed them. Uh, and essentially they divided those into two different uh, statements. First, one was like a claim. So 
this is a position on the motion or a position on the topic. Uh, and then also classifying if it was evident. So this is proving uh, that the position on the motion, the claim itself, is true. And this is, uh, Steve will probably talk about some of this, but this is kind of like um, argumentation 101. It's uh, from uh, a gentleman named uh, Toolman. So this is like kind of taking the Toolman model, which it was like every argument should have a claim, evidence, and warrant. And essentially they said, well, I think the kind of minimal viable product of an argument is just having claim and evidence. And they use this argument mining module to find that. So just to give you an example of what that is uh, in this kind of data set, like the claim could be that uh, preschool is an important investment. So that's a position uh, on the topic of whether preschool should be subsidized. And the actual evidence, uh, again, pulled from these articles was, is there for decades, uh, you know, research has demonstrated there's high quality of preschool, you know, public dollars, and that the children fare better on tests if they go to preschool. So it's linking those two um, and making it or mining the uh, the index or the database of these things to find that. So that's the online stage of argument mining. Then it's actually taking those um, sentences and using two uh, neural models to determine one sentence ranking. So like how actually re relevant is this argument to the topic, and then also taking understanding the stance of it. So even though you know we can read something and understand naturally that maybe this is for or against the topic that's being up for debate, uh, a neural model still needs to make that distinction. So they use that to see if, uh, if this is for or against the motion so they can label that as, as such. So it's actually was really interesting uh, reading some of the papers that we can link to as well um, because they kind of evolved from uh, the project as far as the data sets that they worked with. So first they used um, a UPK ConvArg uh, database, which was essentially, they took two statements and they annotated or labeled it to say uh, which one was most convincing. Um, and then they, and so they had like people to do this and I, I have in my notes exactly how many statements are, uh, that they looked at, but basically taking that argument, which one for or against uh, was the most convincing. Uh, and then another, they evolved from that into UK PK Convar PageRank, and using PageRank being um, the kind of famous uh, module or algorithm that uh, made Google quite popular uh, on ranking the ranking websites. So instead of having this comparison uh, for and against on two uh, topics, they just had one, and they were able to determine which ones were more convincing from that side. And then and then they said, okay, well we really need to have our own kind of data sets so that they kind of evolved. Uh, into their own sort of uh, IBM-based database called EVCon. And that database looked like this, where basically they had a topic, uh, we should legalize same-sex marriage, and then they had two pieces of evidence, one for or supporting the topic, and one against the topic. Uh, and then they had, I think it was like 67 individuals uh, go through and label, which again, uh, was more convincing to them on that. So again, it's still um, you understanding that like, all of these data sets are based on individuals being convinced on these topics so the model can learn from them. And then, and then they kind of realized after um, kind of progressing into this and looking at it from maybe a, a little bit too technical or, or dry perspective or, or argumentation, uh, they kind of monitored human debaters. And one of the main strategies for a, uh, quote unquote professional debater or someone that takes this very serious is that uh, <clears throat> essentially one of the best ways to argue and in, in some formats like debaters don't even have access to the topic uh, until like 15 minutes before they argue it. So like they ask this question like how can these debaters argue for something uh, that they may not know specific knowledge about because they wanted that into the model as well because that's how uh, individuals or humans are really great debaters argue and they got connected to this concept of uh, first principles or argument by principle. And essentially what that is, is basically saying like, okay, you have a topic that maybe would ban something, uh, whether it's smoking or, uh, you know, any of these topics that, uh, you know, we're always kind of in, in the real world talking about removing from society. And the kind of principled argument to that in any type of ban debate you might have is that banning something creates black markets. And then you could have evidence on why black markets are bad or, you know, things like that. 
but they wanted to make sure that there's a module within a, a project debater that could take this approach, uh, understanding the larger context of an, uh, the topic and then applying them to sort of first principles. So that's what they did with this uh, other module called the argument knowledge base. Uh, and then, so the text that they use for these are actually created manually. Um, so they had some text, and essentially what they were doing is then making a classifier to understand the themes of new topics. And they use this concept called a COPA, uh, which sounds very nice if you're a football fan. Uh, but a COPA is like a class of principled arguments. Uh, so they set a set of arguments that are tied to one theme, and they also had like opposing claims for each of those. And they took three motions, basically building on that, on that specific theme. Uh, and they had 37 themes based on that. So they had, and also uh, in some some themes they had like 17 uh, different motions tied to that. So the module or the model could understand that. To give you an example, of what I mean by this, so there's like a theme which is like offensive speech. Uh, so you know you could talk about you know uh, banning someone from Twitter or you know the freedom of expression on the internet. And one of the themes that you will always talk about in this debate is offensive speech. So they took 13 motions that could probably uh, ha be tied to that theme. And then they took uh, four and against. So four expressions that are like, OK, the freedom of expression is meaningless if it does not apply to troubling or controversial ideas. So we can't just say uh, we want freedom of speech only when it's super nice and super easy and we agree with it. Um, that's not the value of freedom of expression. Or they have an, like an against claim, which is like the freedom of expression does not legitimize offending people's values and beliefs. So, you know, even for your expression, uh, if it offends me and doesn't allow me to express myself and my beliefs, uh, that's a, a, a against the, the topic. So now we have a module that understands these larger concepts and can argue from first principles like human does. This is kind of a graphic of that. Um, so you can kind of see um, some of the, the themes here uh, being like if they are further away, they have less like connections to others. Uh, but you can see like greater good, discrimination, uh, religion, offensive speech, they all have kind of connections uh, to other themes uh, or COPAs within this module. And then the third part was about argument rebuttal. So in the public debate, and um, we'll have a link to this as well, you can watch because the, the uh, project debater or the AI debater does not not only just make arguments, it debates someone, right? So he needs to respond to what is being said by the other debater and then make a rebuttal or, or say why the other arguments made by the you know opposing debater is wrong. Uh, so I thought it was super interesting because one of the things that they did was called uh, creating leads. So they sort of like almost predicted what could possibly be said by the other debater. Um, and this is, they did that through first also using the mi mining module. So again, they made all of this module with a whole bunch of arguments to it. So they said, okay, maybe the, the opposing debater will say the things that are already kind of in our data set or in our database. They also use the argument knowledge base. So they know, right, if this is a topic with these themes uh, and a professional debater or debater uses these themes, we can kind of already tell maybe they're going to use make these arguments. So again, they kind of pre-prepared for arguments that the opposing debater will make. And then lastly, they use um, iDebate database. Uh, I think I debate the debate is not publicly accessible anymore, but basically it was a website uh, where people could come and write text debates or kind of train on that. So they had like a series of motions and topics and then like for and against. So they used that as well. So they had all this, you know, cache of data uh, ready to go if they heard an argument that uh, the debater would make. And they used Watson uh, speech to text, so understanding exactly what the debater said, and then applying that um, and using the kind of opposing claims and trying to match them to the arguments that it had already in from the, uh, the previous modules. So they did this for like 200 topics and uh, over 200 topics and 400 speeches. So quite a pretty uh, big range. And then again, as they built the other modules, the mining module and the AKB, uh, that would also grew. Um, and then lastly, it's like, you know, the, the most important thing, like how to actually put together the speech. So first they did like a rule-based system, uh, which was really focusing on removing any duplicates or just any replication, because that's not really persuasive to like continue to say the same things over and over again. And you could see if it like a model or an AI understands like, oh, this is going to be a really effective argument. You know, the 
crazy side of it could be that they just keep saying the same thing because that's a, probably the most efficient way to play the game, right? Uh, so they use a rule basis and remove the duplicates. And then they also did some sort of um, clustering around that. So uh, around different themes to understand, okay, this theme is uh, around uh, certain themes that, that we were debating around. So then they can pull from actually the most convincing arguments. And I thought that was super interesting. One of the things from the, uh, one of the papers that supports this project, they had this distribution of um, supporting words or convincing words. And you can see like, I don't know, again, what's the science in all of this? Maybe Steve can tell us, but uh, it, it, like there's a distribution of like convincing words that they found from the, um, the mining that they did, like poll and found and showed, uh, where um, something like voted for or this support something or opposes wasn't as convincing. So they also could rank the arguments. So they clustered the arguments, uh, removed the duplicates, and they could rank what was more convincing of them and then it obviously kind of choose chose the most convincing ways to communicate and then they had to do some cleanup job like you know it's not going to make sense if they just start reading arguments out so they did some normalization of things and then use the um, ibm watson text-to-speech uh, to actually construct the arguments themselves so these were the results uh, so what they did um, is uh, basically they pulled the audience first uh, before the debate to say, you know, whether you agree on subsidizing preschools. Uh, so 79% agree, 13% disagreed, and 8% undecided. So just to, for clarification, the project debater was arguing to subsidize schools while the human debater was arguing basically against that. So after the debate, uh, what essentially happened, they pulled the audience again. Um, and so 62% now agreed to subsidize schools. So the project debater lost 17% 17 of the uh, audience there. And then um, the human debater gained 17% uh, of the audience on actually agreeing with that. So looking at the swings, again, uh, yeah, humans won. So we can all go home and sleep with tonight that we can at least beat some um, debaters uh, or beat some AIs. But what was interesting, I thought, about the paper was also they kind of, that wasn't a backtrack, but they said, you know, we really, you know, even though debate was a competition, and Steve will talk about a little bit more about this, they wanted to make the project debater uh, designed to help people, help debaters uh, improve their arguments. So they, they kind of said, oh, you know, we lost, but we weren't really trying to win <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but it was, was interesting. They also, um, also presented some hope on, on uh, their project, at least. Because they also compared this to other NLP models or other NLP projects that are around argumentation. Uh, so we have like they have a few ones, GPT-2, and this was before GPT-3 was out. So it'd be interesting to see how convincing GPT-3 is. Uh, but they did some sort of things with argument uh, search, some GPT-2 geared to um, argumentation, uh, and then also some other models around uh, humans. And they basically took that and they basically said, well, at least we have the best. AI, like most convincing AI compared to other models uh, that are out there. Uh, but humans, as you can see here, was still the average score from convincingness um, still won the, the day there. So um, leaving you with something to kind of explore on. Uh, so tied to this, all of this we'll be talking about and what it enables, which I think is a very exciting space around AI, is the natural language processing kind of thing. So Microsoft uh, has a learn module on this. So if you want to go to this link, you can directly kind of understand a little bit more about some of the basics on natural language processing and certainly explore this field as well as other fields in natural language processing around text generation and really how AI can communicate with humans and do things like this. AI debate, um, discuss, you know, question and answer, all of these things are around um, natural language processing. So this is a great place to start and get the understanding of the core knowledge. But cool. Uh, now Steve will tell us if that was even worth doing all of that work uh, with his uh, his three concerns about teaching AI to debate. So, I think I would know how to do it by 
that now. Okay, hopefully my audio is okay. I'm sure the chat will let you know. Hello, everyone here. Hello, everybody watching the Microsoft stream. Um, I'm a teacher. I've been a teacher my whole life, so I'm going to stand. Just makes me feel a little bit more comfortable, um, sadly. So I think everything that, um, that Corey talked about, I think is great, and I have no issue with, and I think it's wonderful. I think uh, what I'm going to do here this evening in this talk is give kind of the humanities point of view to this whole thing. And we're coming as a professor of rhetoric who spent most of my life studying debate and argumentation. Some concerns I have about teaching AI to debate and what it is that we think we're doing and what we might actually be doing. The headline of this is that um, we've been experimenting with AI for a very long time in human history. We've kind of had this fantasy for a while. So going way, 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 way back in time to the 18th century, and I wondered, I looked and I wondered if it had ever come to Stockholm. There was a very famous machine called the Turk. It was a machine made of gears and wood that could play chess. And it became a real phenomenon and a real interest of the courts of Europe. And I do not know if it came here to the king of Sweden at the time. To see, I think at that time the king of Sweden was might have been uh, blocked by the Russian army in Turkey, I think. But uh, I'm not all that up on my... Uh, on my uh, Swedish history, but um, the the Turk had been ordered by Napoleon uh, Bonaparte to be executed, uh, and and it had a, a panel. It would move the pieces, and it had a panel where you look in and see the wires, and the you would see the gears moving. But in the end, it was a trick. They had a very small, a little person who was very good at chess who could see through and move the arm and and play chess through. And they had a mirror kind of trick. And sometimes I wonder when I read about AI if we're still just kind of doing this to ourselves that it's really a person. And if you watch the, the IBM debate, you see there's a panel of people kind of going through um, the debater and, and kind of letting it, um, you know, seeing how it's going, kind of helping it along. And you wonder how much of a human is in there and how much of it is in gears. Another great example of this would be IBM's other project, Deep Blue, which was the chess playing computer that took on Garry Kasparov in the 90s. And I think you might remember that. And Kasparov always maintained that he shouldn't have lost the, the one match he did to that because the room was full of 100 grandmasters who were sitting there having coffee going over the moves of Deep Blue and they couldn't look into the cabinet. You couldn't look in to see the wire. So it's kind of this thing. So I wonder about whether AI is something that we're really creating. The artificial intelligence is self-aware. I mean, in the news, there's a Google engineer who thinks that their AI has become self-aware, has become a big advocate for this uh, or big uh, concerned about this. So I wonder if this is more of a fantasy about telling us about who we are as human beings and what we would like to do. And maybe that we're lonely and we'd like a friend who's not human who can maybe tell us that everything is going to be okay. From a literature point of view, this might be kind of an interesting fantasy. So we've had that for a while. And then another example is the ELISA project, which was in the 70s, 80s, where they tried to create a Rogerian therapist in, I think this was even written in BASIC, uh, as far as computer language go. Where they, and that program still has some some uh, attention out there. You can you can play with Eliza on websites, on various websites. So my concerns today, I'm going to echo a lot of things that Corey has already said, but um, let's get into some of my concerns. Concern number one, what is a debate? What's the definition of debate? And I don't mean to be incredibly critical of IBM's team or critical of, of anybody here, but defining a debate is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, throughout the history of debate, which I think uh, in the United States, maybe in Great Britain, in the UK, has a similar history, but debate in the United States is a long, long, long history of being taught, even all the way back to the colonial chartered colleges when it was a series of colonies. Debate was part of the curriculum, but there were always fights about what debate should be and how to define it. Now, I had some clips. We already saw one clip from from Corey, so we might move uh, past that clip, which I think I so it's a lot of information. But I wanted to show a little bit about of Harish speaking, but I think I'm in the interest of time. What I'm going to do is move um, to this clip, which I think kind of speaks to my primary concern about debate uh, model. So I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this, but um, let's play this clip. And this is a clip with one of the, with one of the lead designers uh, of Project Debater. During the pre, pre to the rebuttal page the place in the debate, they took a break for them to prepare the rebuttal. And then he had he was brought up to the stage by the host, who's the host of Intelligence Squared. You probably recognize him if you watch Intelligence Squared debates on YouTube, like I do. You might re re recognize him, but he hosted the debate and served as the moderator for the debate. And uh, 
I hope you can hear what, what he has to say. So here, I will so. try to explain briefly what is happening under the hood. So thank you, John. As uh, you stated, we just heard two interesting opening speeches by uh, Project Debater and Harish. And Project Debater, as we speak, is now trying to uh, prepare the rebuttal speech. And as we know, in a debate, the rebuttal is the most uh, challenging part. So the system is starting by using Watson speech recognition capabilities in order to understand the... Okay, I think Corey covered everything that this guy is going to um, talk about after this part. But that was an interesting part that struck me because he said, we're about to prepare the rebuttals, which everyone knows is the most challenging part. And I said, huh, why is the rebuttal the most challenging part? What does he mean? I think he might mean, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, it's the most challenging part for IBM's project debater because of what Corey said. I think that that makes sense in terms of the technical ability of the AI to be able to understand what a human's saying while a human's kind of coming up with the arguments as they're going, because Harish spoke second, so he's responding to what the machine said. And, and kind of speaking, like sometimes we all have that experience where we're presenting. I might be having experience now. Where we're presenting, and we're not exactly sure what's coming out of our mouth next. We have the general idea of what we're going to say next, but we've all been there in a presentation in your team or for a boss or interview, and you're like, wow, that was brilliant. And then you realize you've said it. I think athletes refer to this as being in the zone. But um, that's kind of the, the, the uh, English colloquialism for it. But um, I think he might be meaning the technical side is the most difficult, but it got me thinking that depending on who you are or where you are or what you're doing or the topic, every part of debate could be difficult. Why would the rebuttal be the most difficult part? I think he means it's a challenge for that, but it opens the, for, the, for the system, for the programmers of the system. But it opens the question for me to think about what is the most challenging part and who gets to determine that? And in rhetoric, we have an answer to this, and that's the audience. My primary concern about all this debate modeling with AI is it's not audience centric, it's structurally centric. It's centric to there's a universal understanding of a good argument. There's a universal understanding of evidence. There's a universal understanding of persuasion. None of these things in rhetoric or in psychology or philosophy have really been settled. And I think to, to when you do that, you're making a political choice, not big P politics, but not like right wing, left wing, but a political choice about how you're going to model argument. And I wonder how that's been determined. Corey talked about earlier how they uh, use the Toolman model. And the Toolman model is familiar to anyone who's taken a writing course, a persuasive writing course, or a public speaking course about argument or persuasion, which is that T model. I don't have an image of it here. I probably should have put one in there thinking about it. It's that T model of we have data or information and we have a claim. What sticks those things together? And Stephen Toolman, who wrote the book in the late 1950s, was very interested in the question of how people could identify formal logical fallacies very well and then still go out and make terrible decisions and still go out and believe things they shouldn't believe. How come you can get a very high mark on a logical fallacy exam and then not, we'll get into this a little bit later in Concern 3 in more detail. So he wrote this book, Uses of Argument. It's still a, a pretty popular book, but it's not popular in philosophy because he says these things are very inductive, very bottom up, and they're all determined on the audience. Like, um, you can't smoke in here has different meanings based on where you are. So, like, you could be on an airplane and say, sorry, sir, you can't smoke on the plane, and you light a cigarette and say, yes, I can. It's a, it's a misunderstanding, right? But we have these normative forces in society that show us what things mean. So the choice of basing it on the structure of argument on the Internet or the structure of arguments that people have liked on the Internet, I wonder what it is that their audience is that they're connecting it to. And if they're connecting it to the audience of people who are looking for political debate or some kind of disagreement on the internet, that's, a, that's an interesting choice. I wonder if that choice is compared to other ones, which is the way I would teach debate, which is audiences are always changing. Values are changing. What's on people's minds are always changing. What people consider to be most important are changing. And I wonder if the AI model might be better situated to helping us with that rather than being very, very good at a very tightly structured game, which is what... Um, you know, he, Harish has won all of these championships in and what they're kind of testing it against. The, the litmus strip might not work if, it's, if the solution is neither acidic or basic, is my concern. I wonder if maybe the model should be more audience-centric. Um, Words. So they also took Project Debater to Cambridge, and this is where I think, uh, not to disparage the IBM team or anything, kind of, they're kind of rolling back what they're saying about being able to debate is kind of a new Turing test. I don't know if they're saying that, but that's the way the media is taking it. 
the new Turing test would be if a if a AI could successfully debate and convince people it was right, we've got AI. And I think that's an interesting way to think about that. They're kind of dialing it back and saying that maybe the role of project debaters is to help humans debate better by giving them more information. But I wonder about that too, because information or more facts or more evidence is usually what we say when we're frustrated in an argument with somebody. We say, why don't you just listen to the facts? Why can't you just buy the facts? What's wrong with you? Well, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just not the way humans reason. It's not the function of reason. Uh, humans, the, 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 the persuasive part of an argument is in the connection made between audience and speaker. If I can make a very good connection with you, and I can make you see I share your values, even though I'm not from this city or even from this country, but I share your values, I, 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 I see things are important. I can even give a little humor and show you that perhaps we share even some sense of what's funny. Uh, I make that connection, and then I can say, okay, look, my ideas here are based in facts and experts and things. So what's more important is that I give you a resonance with them. There's a harmony that comes out of them, and that's what uh, powerful uh, speaking and persuasive speaking is all about, is that connection. So the Cambridge example, and I think I have a little video clip here that maybe we can watch a couple of minutes of to get a sense of what it was doing at Cambridge. Uh, it's very, it's kind of a bad quality video here, but you can get a little sense of what, what they were doing with Project Debater there. Debater is designed by IBM Research. It will deliver a speech based on 1,100 arguments collected from union members and others over the past week. It will not be taking points of information. Project Debater, please take the floor. The speech is based on 570 arguments contributed by people around the globe, supporting the idea that AI will bring more harm than good. There are five issues that will be elaborated on now. The first will demonstrate how AI may take problematic decisions. The next issue is bias. In addition, we will hear about employment, societies, and control. About decision making. AI will not be able to make a decision that is the morally correct one, because morality is unique to humans. It cannot make moral decisions easily and can lead to disasters. AI can cause a lot of harm. It uses judgments in making decisions. It can only make decisions it has been programmed for, and it is not possible to program for all scenarios. Only humans can. Intelligence is a danger because it carries many risks, such as accidents, misuse, and the AI. Okay, so that's about all of that video that I wanted to. They used uh, an application. No. Um, and we'll get into concern two in a second, but as we leave concern one behind. Thinking about that Cambridge model, that was the AI doing extremely well of taking a large amount of information and making generalizations about it, which I think is an incredibly impressive task. I think that's impressive. But that's sort of the first step one would do once one has been given one's topic, which we'll get into here in a second. Once you've been given your topic in a formal debate, like what Cambridge Union does and what debating societies around the world do, then you have to think about, okay, what can I come up with that would be reasonable, that would be reasonable uh, evidence that would support doing this thing or supporting this thing. And I think that it can be very, very powerful in that to give a sense of what's out there. But I think that providing a summary of that information isn't necessarily constructing the argument because the AI has to go a bit further to make those connections to show people why they should be interested and why they should feel something about the issue that's being debated, why they should care, and why this information matters to them. Like it's sort of like I show these films to my students when I teach debate. And they complain about the AI debater. They say, oh, it's boring. It's just a list of facts. They're not trying to get me on their side. And I was like, well, now you know how I feel watching some of your debates in here. I mean, they're beginner debaters. Maybe I shouldn't be so mean to them. But I say the same thing. They're kind of shocked. And they're like, wow, it's sort of like the AI shows us exactly what we don't want debate to be, which we do like. We, we're very skeptical of emotions and passion and feeling. But we do want that in there because debate is about connection. We're going to get at that in the concern too. So concern one is, What's the debate model that you're using when you're modeling these AI debates and testing it? It hasn't been thought out. The Toolman model has five parts. I think Corey talked in the paper about how they stripped it down to two. And Toolman himself is trying to get away from that logical model of evidence claim. He said, that's obviously not working for us. We've taught that for years. We had extreme fascism and war in Europe. We want to move away from that. We need a better model of reasoning. So we have data warrant claim, backing, qualifier, uh, rebuttal as part of his model. And if you're interested in that, at the end of the talk, we can talk more about Stephen Tolman's work. 
I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I don't think it's the best model for AI for reasons that I won't get into right now, but I think it's a very good way of thinking about how humans inductively argue, but it might not be what an AI designer would want to have its system do to, to prove anything. So this might be a fruitful place for people who are working on AI systems and debate to work with people in the humanities and say, could we come up with a debate model that would not be uh, objective or universal in a sense of what a good argument is, but something that's much more of like, how do I judge an audience and see how they would connect to the information that's out there? Because the rhetorical challenge that's almost 3,000 years old now, all ancient people from around the world have faced this challenge, which is, how do I get this really great information to be something that that audience would care about and agree to do? How do I get that to happen when I don't want to use force or violence? I don't want to bribe them. I want to do it ethically. I want to do it with words, and I want to do it with the, the power of mind and language. How do I do that? So let's think about reason and debating as concern too. So concern one would be solved if we would work with AI designers in the humanities, come up with a model of debate that will work for that. So that's the concern. What's the model of debate? It's unclear where that's coming from, and there are problems with it from the theories of debate that's audience-generated rhetorical understanding debate this audience generates what a good argument is. The audience is always the decider. According to Toolman and a number of other theorists, the audience decides whether an argument is good. And that's pretty much where it is, unless you're in philosophy, and then you could say, well, my argument's good. It doesn't, if nobody understood it, who cares? And that's kind of the philosopher's take. The rhetorician's take, my take is, oh my gosh, that's the most important thing. That's the most important thing, is if I can't connect with my audience, I might as well have not even spoken one word. Okay, concern two. What's the relationship between reason and debating? I put the capital R there for a reason. Ha <laughs> ha. But a uh, formal reason. What's the re relationship between this and debating? My concern is that debating might be thought of by people around the world after I started studying this stuff as the place to teach people how to be more logical. And I just don't think debate does that. I think debate is incredibly powerful and valuable, but I just don't think it helps people become more logical. I think it helps people become more confident and better communicators, which might be more valuable than hitching your wagon or completely committing to logical, evidence-based decision-making. And that's a very popular phrase now. We have evidence-based everything, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based testing, evidence-based product design, all these things. What does that mean? I think it means that we're looking outside of our own selves, but I don't think it, it gets much stronger than that. Like, what did this work the last time that we did it? So what's the relationship here? Well, one of my favorite American rhetorical theorists is Kenneth Burke, and I'll put his quote here because it really speaks to the concerns I have with the model for AI, but it also speaks to the concerns with debate teaching in general. Which is where he says, the debater suggests his facts lead to his resolved, or the motion is the American word for the motion. But we know his position was assigned him, and he selects his facts accordingly. Now, Burke is not saying that debate's a problem here, that debate is teaching people an incredibly important thing which is, how do I create a sense of motive to get a particular attitude out of the audience? And I think when debate is taught well, what it teaches people how to do is how to present themselves as being motivated by this or that, depending on not whether the audience will like it, but what the audience's attitude towards the topic and towards their side will be. So in any formal debate, you're given your side. I mean, in the Project Debater debate, they gave uh, Harish the difficult side, I think, uh, and that's not his personal belief. It might be his personal belief, but that would be irrelevant to being assigned that position. Sometimes you get lucky or students think they're lucky. They're like, I got to assign my personal belief. This is great. It's going to be so easy. And then they go into the debate and they're like, oh, wow, I was so wrong about that. And it's a great learning experience. And that's good. But what Burke is pointing us out here is to say it's not about being factual is not a, the process of debate. It's about how do I create an attitude among the audience to where they will feel like, oh yeah, I want to identify with this. Yeah, I want to be a part of this. And how can I make the motives of my opponent, I'm gesturing towards Corey, he's not my opponent, but uh, my opponent <laughs> and uh, myself, how can I make their motives seem suspect and my motives seem pure so I can get the attitude to be like, well, this is the side I want to be on. And that's why I put this quote in here because it's a good way to start. The most important book for thinking about reason came out a few years ago, 2017, I want to say, 2018, by Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber. Uh, one of them, and I forget which one, one of them is a philosopher, and one of them is a cognitive psychologist. This book 
really, really will change your attitude about reason, high level reason, because we all tend to like this narrative of how reasons motivate our decision making. And we always have good reasons and evidence. That's why we decide to do something. But in their comprehensive study, and it's a wonderful book to read, and it's very accessible. It's something you can read and really enjoy because they're very funny and they're not too scientific. But uh, all of their research is great. Is they say reasons are primarily for social consumption. They're not what we base our decisions. Our reasons are ex post facto. That is, we usually make a decision in the black box of the mind, and then we justify it by trying to relate to other people and to the normative structure of society. Reasons are for other people to consume to see our relationship to the normative, to the way society works, which is not the true way a society should work. I don't know where you live, but I bet you'd agree with that, right? Like, oh man, my society is kind of off with, but there are certain things in society that are considered the proper way to be. And it's to get other people to build that trust so that people will listen to you. And I think that's a fascinating, their research time and time again shows this. Um, and then they get into other stuff. Most of the, this is a great quote. Most of the questions that people encounter in their daily life or in pursuit of their longer term interests cannot in any way be answered by following instructions. So when we tell people that what they need to do is look at the facts and compare and make a chart, it doesn't really help them solve the issue. Actually, what happens to me is I end up making the decision I know in my heart I shouldn't make because I look at all these reasons. And I'm like, yeah, I should go buy that new laptop or whatever. I can't afford that. I shouldn't do that. Or I should go have pizza again. I shouldn't eat pizza at all let alone three times a week, right? So, I mean, we're about to have pizza at the end of this talk here for those of us in the reactor, but uh, maybe not the best example. But um, an interesting thing is that we kind of like this idea of rules, like reason and logic and rationality guiding our decisions, but the black box of the mind, is human. the human brain is not the human mind. And when we reduce things down to brain science, we tend to find that it's just inadequate for how we make decisions. And it's still kind of a mystery why we make those decisions, but it's not a mystery of how reasons function. We explain our reasons to other people in order to position ourselves in the, the gestalt of, of, uh, of our society. Right? It's a fascinating thing. Reasons serve communication and human cooperation by expressing mental states normatively and communicating their normative force, setting expectations and building trust. So their argument is that reasons don't exist to help us find the truth or to be right but to help us cooperate through communication, which is our unique and most powerful evolutionary development. They say it's communication. Now, one of them is a cognitive scientist and an evolutionary scientist too. And I don't know how you feel about evolutionary psychology. It's quite a controversial field. It's quite nascent, I would say. But their arguments are very persuasive in this book. And the experiments they do tend to show that this is the way people use reason. I don't think it's a bad thing. Building trust, how could that be a bad thing? How could being more communicative and cooperative be a bad thing? We're not accessing what we're doing when we do reason. So I, I wonder when we're teaching AI to debate, if we're thinking that, are we teaching the AI that presenting reasons will make people decide this? Or should we teach the AI the way people actually use reasons and make the AI, now this would be the scary singularity part, the AI starts to fold itself in with human trust and human belonging, but we but we we recognize that motives are always constructed. That's what Burke teaches us. When we ascribe a motive to someone, why they're doing what they're doing, we're like, oh, it's because they, they want the best for us. What happens if we do that to AI? Or we do that with AI? We're like, oh, the AI wants the best for us. We're kind of being less critical, but that's the way rhetoric kind of works. So this book, The Enigma of Reason, I can't recommend it strongly enough. Uh, whenever I assign it and teach it, the students, their minds are blown and your mind will be blown too. I, I really like this book and I think it will make you think differently about how to debate when, or how to argue with other people as well, which might help you out quite a lot in your own life. We recognize this in pop culture. There are many famous debates that occur in film and television that are kind of silly or they're kind of lampooning debate. The one I know the best is from this 1970s American TV show is called Welcome Back, Cotter, which I don't know if anybody knows Welcome Back, Cotter. Gabe Kaplan, the famous uh, comedian. Anyway, the very first episode of that show was a debate. And what the debate shows is not it, all these debates, like from Clueless or from Parks and Rec and these other shows, what they show us is that we recognize that debate is about taking a position in relation to normative societal rules and what is a g decent justification and not. And all these lampoon that because the person who doesn't have the facts, doesn't have the information, usually ends up saying the true thing. 
because they're talking about, well, everybody thinks, and they kind of like express their normative sense of the world, and it's disproportionate to it. So they're always, in pop culture, anytime you see a debate in film or on television, there's many examples of this. In American pop culture, there are many examples of this. Look for that, because you'll see them, the way that they use the reasons to justify their position is funny, because we recognize that debate is about positioning ourselves in relation to the normative values and structure of society. So I wonder if it would be possible to get AI, maybe maybe the word clouds or the looking at the arguments and thing, maybe you should look at how people deal with an embarrassing situation or how people uh, talk about, well, that's just the way it is, like which is the way normative stuff goes. It's like, no, that's how, it, that's how it goes. That's the way it should happen. That's the way it should be. These kind of things might be interesting to train the, the, um, the AI modules on. So for question two, I would say debate's a place where you practice communication via reason giving in some relation to the normative. So we give reasons for why we think our position is good, and then we try to make it feel like it's the right or the natural way things should go. Now, I wonder if this is the idea of the relationship of reason and debate for, uh, the, mo for the people working on the algorithm. This is another great place where I think people who are designing and working on AI can really get a lot from humanities, looking at literature, looking at anthropology, looking at sociology, and looking at rhetoric and working together to come up with what those, those big, giant buckets of data are that you're feeding the system. How would that change if you did like that? And then a debate could be proof of, it, of um, the artificial intelligence. But we're going to get to that in the third concern, too. My other concern is that AI debate models uh, encourages a thinking of human debate practices as somewhat flawed. What's the relationship? I think it's a spurious relationship between intelligence and being able to debate. Because we have a lot of suspicion about that connection, don't we? Even if we might say, oh, they're very smart. They're, very, they're a real champion debater. You can look at um, just recently in House of Commons that Boris Johnson was made fun of by Keir Starmer uh, for making some arguments like, well, that might fly in an Oxford debate, but not in here. And it got a big laugh. I think people do recognize that distinction. If you look at um, television shows, you show these people as somewhat detached or snooty, back to pop culture snooty, or out of connection with the way the world really functions, but very good at debate. There's that part, too. But debate is a powerful thing. The way we argue is extraordinarily powerful. Toulmin got a hold of that early on in the 50s, and many people have run with it. It's not consistent or resonance with logical thinking or the truth or rationality. It's consistent with humans in communicative relationship. Let me give an example about how the AI might do this. One of the more popular things, I think, that they're probably, Corey can correct me if I'm wrong, but Lists of logical fallacies are probably a very popular thing to get the AI to identify. So you could feed it all these examples of fallacies. You know, tu quoque, ex post facto, uh, petitio principi. The, the, the Latins had great fun coming up with all these things. You can go and look at Renaissance books. If you go to an old library, old university libraries, Renaissance books in, a, 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 in Italian or in Latin of just lists and lists and lists of fallacies. Maybe if maybe the fallacies might not be the best thing to be to be giving it. Maybe the fallacies work only if you keep this um, ideal sense of debate or argument um, on high. The ideal, the fallacies wouldn't appear. But maybe if debate is for human connection, trust building, and all that, maybe it'd be something different. So there's a philosopher in Belgium, uh, Martin Baudry. I think it's Baudry, or it could be Baudry. Maybe the chat will correct me. I don't know. He's got a great uh, blog. This is a screenshot of his blog. He is very famous for speaking about these kind of things, but he's come up with this idea of the fallacy fork. And this is probably his best explanation of it in 2017. He's written on it um, in uh, scholarly literature, but I think his blog post is the most accessible and clear for everyone who's not maybe a professional philosopher or academic. Uh, and he's also been on uh, Belgian television, I think even on Dutch television, talking about how to reason and things like that. Really smart guy. Great. He does great work. The fallacy fork really kind of pre pre presents to us a paradox about how fallacies work. And that paradox is this. When you locate a fallacy and you find it, it might be so easy to locate and decide what it is that the entirety of the text that you find it in might be in question for being persuasive. So if you find clear examples of the fallacy, it questions whether the text is even at a level where it would persuade people. So when we're teaching this in school, is the example he primarily gives, where the examples of the fallacy are in texts that are so stupidly written that they wouldn't persuade anyone, so the danger isn't really there. So it's kind of overkill, maybe, is one way of thinking about it. But if you do find a fallacy, 
in a content, in a, in a real world argument, the argument might be so complex and might have so much information in it and might be so rooted to the everyday and filled with so much kind of swirling material that the only option when we identify a fallacy is what? Dismiss the argument. It's, it's based on fallacy. It's almost like that American, um, legal principle when dealing with uh, witnesses. Falsum in uno, falsum in omnibus. If a witness lies about one thing, then they probably lied about everything. And this is the way it's handled in American law. Falsum in uno, falsum in omnibus. But that's not a good standard either because somebody could lie about something because they're embarrassed about it. And the jury and everybody was like, no, it's perfectly fine. But they feel, feel personally embarrassed about it. But if you can prove that they lied about it, well, then all of their testimony is in doubt. Our only thing that we teach people to do when they encounter fallacies is throw the entire argument out. So this is the fallacy fork, and we're, we're kind of skewered by it. Either the identification of the fallacy is too simple, the argument is not persuasive, or the other way, it's too complex. So this is something that I think Valdry's work needs to be considered in the AI modeling. As a final thought about this whole thing as we, as we bring it to, as I bring my comments here to a close, um, we tend to think of these things in terms of the human brain having two opposite, maybe cooperative sometimes sides. We have our left side of our brain, which is logical and rational. We have our right side, which is creative and uh, spontaneous. This is a model that perhaps we could change and say, according to the work of, uh, in um, uh, the book that I mentioned earlier, uh, in the, the um, yeah, in their work, uh, that this is a communicative organ. It's not meant to do much else other than to help us communicate, build trust, and to cooperate with one another. So instead of having this kind of attitude towards the brain, where it's split into these two hemispheres, maybe we could think about this as being blurred together in some way, to where what we're doing when we speak is we're trying to communicate, build trust, and things like that. That's like with some fallacies, like the most famous fallacy right now in our present day is the fallacy of uh, confirmation bias. And confirmation bias very simply is if you read information on the internet that leans in the direction you already feel is right, you're going to give that information a huge amount more credit than any information that doesn't lean your way. And this is proven time and time and time again. This is only a problem if we're reasoning on things like social media or in chat rooms or Reddit by ourselves and we're not interacting with other human beings. According to um, uh, Baudry and according to um, the other people in the book, in, uh, in the, uh, the Enigma of Reason book, um, Hugo Mercier and Sperber, they say the confirmation bias is actually a my side bias, is what they call it. And they say it's actually a very powerful tool if you're in groups of people and you're trying to get them to trust and believe in what you say. The fact that you can very quickly re-explain why you're right is kind of baked in. And that's why it, it kind of short circuits us on the internet. And then people and audiences, we're all very good at criticizing other people's opinions. And that's an evolutionary adaptation too. So if we think about the brain like, when we're thinking about artificial intelligence, we're trying to get this left hemisphere down first, and then the creative part will come maybe. Maybe that's the theory. But blurring it together and saying, let's teach an AI system to communicate rather than be smart or debate might be the way to go. Debate is meant to investigate if reasons stick. Are the reasons good? Who determines that? An audience. Accuracy, truthfulness, fact, factiness, factacity, I guess is the word. Factiness, maybe that's a new word. That's not the goal of debate. It's not to be true. It's not to be right. It's to make the communication to make people feel that you're on the right side of the issue. There might still need to be work that has to be done before you get a decision or you get a plan, but that's the goal of debate. Debate is to test our communicative prowess and our ability to give reasons for social consumption, to build trust and a willingness to cooperate and communicate to find a better solution. Most of the time when you're in a debate, neither side ends up winning and everyone says, what were we talking about? Or they say, oh, there's these five questions we need to go investigate now. And that's healthy debating not beating somebody in a, uh, a highly structured game. Those are my three concerns. That's where I'll leave it. Okay, well, goodbye to the chat. The broadcast is shutting down.